Hello and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology at Glen Oaks Community College. I'm Dr. Ren Hartung. For this video, I want to talk about feedback mechanisms. These, are, these mechanisms are the way that we maintain homeostasis inside of the body. And I've already described in the video I just did um, what homeostasis is, but let me describe it again briefly. Homeostasis is the tendency for the internal environment of the body to stay relatively stable. It is a dynamic state of equilibrium that all living things have to maintain in order to stay healthy and alive. So that's homeostasis in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to use the graph thing here again, partly to describe it again. You can imagine, um, this will also be useful later, you can imagine some level inside of the human body being graphed here over time. This could be blood sugar, blood pressure, it could be oxygen levels, it could be electrolyte levels, whatever it is. This factor, if we observe it over time, it might go up, but if it does, it's going to come back down again. And it might go down, but if it does, it's going to come back up again. And the mechanism that's making this happen is called negative feedback. So negative feedback is how we maintain homeostasis. And again, what we're saying is if, if this environmental factor inside of the body is going a bit too high, then it's going to be brought back down again. If it's going too low, then it's going to be brought back up again. And we could repeat the process over and over again. And over time, you'd see this factor fluctuating here and there, but staying relatively stable within what we call the homeostatic range. Now here's why I drew that out again. There's two reasons. One is to talk about the set point. If I draw a dashed line through here representing a rough, <laughs> very rough idea of the average of all of these numbers over time, if we average them we get this average over time which we consider to be the set point. So it's a mathematically determined thing, um, but you can also imagine um, set point you can imagine it as being, this is where the body wants to keep whatever this level is. It wants to keep it around the set point. And it doesn't work perfectly, so it doesn't keep it right at the set point, but it's always near the set point and, again, within homeostatic range. Um, now, one more usefulness of this graph is to un understand specifically what negative means and negative feedback, because I don't want you to be confused by it. Um, Usually students get this part of it, which is if the level's going up, negative feedback is going to bring it back down again. But really what negative means here is whichever direction the initial stimulus or the initial change happens in, whether it's up or down, the negative feedback loop is going to take it in the opposite direction. So obviously if the level is going up, then the negative feedback loop is going to bring it back down. But by the same token, if that level is going down, negative feedback is going to go in the opposite direction. So negative feedback is going to bring it back up again. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. And now we'll talk about more terms to do with negative feedback loops, but keep that set point idea in mind because I'll talk about it again. In order for a negative feedback loop to be there, we have to have a few things. We have to have a stimulus. And again, that stimulus is the change in that environmental factor, either up or down, that is at risk of going outside of homeostasis, maybe. Something has to detect that stimulus, so we need a detector. And the detector, again, is just going to detect what level we're at, and it'll see, it'll detect whether we're going too high or too low. The detector can't make a change, so it has to report the detector doesn't even determine where we want to be, it just detects when there's a change. Um, so the detector reports to what we call a control center. And here's where set point comes back in. You can imagine the control center as determining what the set point is supposed to be and aiming to stay around that set point. But the control center usually isn't going to change that factor, it's going to trigger another organ or a hormone or such that is actually going to make the change, and we call that the effector. 
Effectors are used here, but in other places within physiology. Uh, just imagine an effector, again, as a hormone or as an organ that is going to make a change in whatever the environmental factor inside of the body is. That's what the effector is. And that effector, then, is going to have an effect on that initial stimulus, which is going to be in the opposite direction. Okay, so there's our terms. Stimulus, detector, control center, effectors. Um, let's do a couple of specific stories about negative feedback loops to make it more clear to you, I hope. Imagine, uh, I'll, I'll do blood pressure. Imagine that there is an increase in blood pressure. The person's blood pressure went up. We have detectors for this. They're called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are stretch receptors found in the carotid bodies up in your neck and in the, um, the aorta, the big major artery coming off the heart. So baroreceptors in major arteries. and they detect that the blood pressure is going up. They report that to the control center, and the control center says, oh, blood pressure is going up. Well, we don't want it to go too high, so let's bring it back down. Um, and in this case, the control center for blood pressure um, will say that it's uh, the brain, and more specifically, the medulla, or, more, or even more specific, the medulla oblongata. So, again, blood pressure goes up. That's detected by the detectors, the baroreceptors, and the major arteries. Those detectors send that information to the brain. Hey, medulla, that blood pressure is going up. And the medulla says, oh, well, there's the set point, and we're above that set point. It's gone too high. Let's bring it back down again. So the uh, medulla then signals to the effector, in this case, the heart. And in this case, the way that the control center is going to signal to the, to the heart to deal with this is to decrease heart rate. If we decrease heart rate, that is going to lower blood pressure. So you could say at the end here, blood pressure comes back down. And that's a negative feedback loop with all of its little details for one specific internal factor of the body's internal environment. Um, and by the way, the same story could be told in reverse. Imagine if the blood pressure went down. The same receptors are going to detect that. The baroreceptors detect that the blood pressure went down. They report that to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata says, oh, blood pressure is down. We need to bring it back up again. So it signals to the heart, causes the heart rate to increase. And with an increased heart rate, you're going to see an increase in blood pressure. And you could think of this story um, of this negative feedback loop operating all day long inside of you to keep blood pressure where you need it to be, to keep it within a homeostatic range. Um, other ones that we could talk about, um, oxygen levels. Um, you want oxygen levels to be relatively high inside of the human body. Maybe that's more, maybe that's not one, but I'll talk about it. It's really CO2 levels that we detect. When you breathe, um, your body is paying very close attention to carbon dioxide levels. And if carbon dioxide levels build up too high, there's a detector for that. And that detector signals to the pons and the medulla oblongata and says that we need to increase breathing in order to blow off the excess CO2. And going along with that, if you're breathing more and blowing off more CO2, you're going to keep oxygen levels high. Um, we could also talk about blood sugar. Here it gets... Uh, a little bit more, maybe, maybe a little bit difficult, more difficult to understand, but let me try and run through it. Um, imagine in a normal person, blood sugar goes a little bit too high. Maybe you ate three Krispy Kreme donuts at once or something. So blood sugar is going up. You have blood sugar detectors, um, and they are actually in the pancreas. So here, the, the detector and the control center is housed in the same place. There are pan pancreatic cells that detect the blood sugar, and they signal to other cells in the pancreas, which are called beta cells. Um, I'll just call them insulin, insulin producing cells.
Those so yeah. insulin producing cells then release insulin and you could call insulin the effector maybe but maybe more accurately it would be skeletal muscle and the liver. What the insulin does is it tells the liver and it tells skeletal muscle to absorb glucose and that decreases the blood pressure. So we, sorry, it decreases the blood sugar. So we see a decrease in blood sugar. Now, so far I've shared three specific negative feedback mechanisms that have real life impact on you on a daily basis. I'm hoping that helps you understand negative feedback and I think we've covered negative feedback well enough. So let's talk about positive feedback. And I'll go back to my graph here for a quick second. Um, for positive feedback, imagine the initial stimulus is that some level has gone outside or towards the towards the, the outside of the homeostatic range. For positive feedback, the reaction is the opposite for negative. Instead of, instead of bringing this back down again, positive feedback is going to make this thing go way up. It's going to make it go outside of the homeostatic range. Positive feedback loops do this, though, for specific, very important reasons. If there's a factor that a positive feedback loop is causing to go outside of homeostasis, it's probably doing it for a good reason. It's doing it because something needs to be accomplished. And if that thing is not accomplished, then the person is going to be very ill or they're going to die. The favorite example for positive feedback loop, which I think makes it clear, is um, labor. When a woman is in labor, in labor delivering a baby the initiation of the positive feedback loop in this case is it's initiated in order to deliver the baby that's the big job that must be accomplished and if mom enters labor but doesn't deliver the baby then that's obviously a very bad thing for baby and a very bad thing for mom so that's an example of a thing that it, it's got to be accomplished and we go outside of negative we go outside of homeostasis for a relatively short time in order to accomplish it although I know that labor can be long in terms of hours or even a full day or longer, um, but considering how long we live, it's still a brief period of time. That's, that's the frame that I'm looking at. Um, so let's talk about positive feedback loop in those same terms in terms of uh, a stimulus, a detector, um, a control center. and um, an effector. The stimulus in this case, by the way, is baby's head pushing against mom's cervix. Baby's head is pushing against mom's cervix and that's causing mom's cervix to stretch. There are stretch receptors in mom's cervix. So cervix is the, or maybe I'll say stretch receptors in the cervix. No, I'm sorry. My bad. Scratch that. Sorry. Um, the stimulus is actually baby's head pushing, and I'm just going to talk about it. So the stimulus, again, is baby's head pushing against mom's cervix and causing it to stretch. There are stretch receptors in the cervix. Those are the detector and the stretch receptor detectors in the cervix signal up to the brain and they tell the brain hey we're in labor the cervix is being stretched and the brain says oh we are okay release oxytocin oxytocin is a hormone that triggers the effector in this case the uterine muscle the muscles of the uterus smooth muscle in the uterus and you get stronger uterine contractions and they push baby's head against the cervix even more Stretch receptors fire even more, sends more signals to the brain. Brain says release more oxytocin, so the hormones released, and the uh, contractions of the uterus get even greater. And that continues until there's enough cervical um, stretch to, make, to allow baby to come out, and there's enough uterine contraction strength to actually expel the baby, to deliver the baby. That's one example. Another example, blood clotting. Um, 
the stimulus is a cut in the blood vessel and the blood is leaking out of the blood vessel. And again, we're going to go outside of homeostasis in order to stop the bleeding in this case, to do something very important because if the person keeps bleeding, they might bleed to death. So the blood gets out, that's the stimulus. There are platelets inside of that blood. And when the blood gets out of the blood vessel, the platelets detect this and they get um, excited, they turn on and they do what's called de degranulation and they become very sticky. The chemicals that the platelets release when they get stimulated stimulate other platelets. So now we get another platelet stimulated. That platelet stimulates four more platelets. You can see the positive feedback loop coming where we activate more and more and more platelets in order to stop the bleeding and then we can calm back down again. So another way to think of positive feedback loops Yes, they take us outside of homeostatic range. That, by the way, makes them more dangerous than negative feedback loops. But under healthy conditions, they're taking us outside of homeostatic range to accomplish a specific job. And really, these positive feedback loops are part of larger negative feedback loops that help to maintain homeostasis. So they're both involved with maintaining homeostasis. And that's positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops. Um, and again, a brief discussion of homeostasis. So here's what you should do. Here's your homework or your quiz. Um, describe what negative feedback loops are and why they're important and or how they relate to homeostasis. That's just for negative feedback loops. And then describe positive feedback loops and describe how they are important for health and disease. Um, and how they relate to homeostasis. If you can do that in the form of an essay question or go through what I just did in terms of diagramming out a negative feedback loop, maybe telling the story of a negative feedback loop and or a positive feedback loop, then if you can do that on your own, writing it all out, then you've got it. You understand it. And it's going to be hard to trick you with multiple choice questions. So that's it for positive and negative feedback loops or feedback mechanisms. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And thank you once again for watching.